let's dig into God's word today. Amen? There's no one here to say amen. All right, we got a few people here to say amen. This is, like I said, so different and so unique, and I'm not sure what to do with it. The one thing I'm worried about is they say the camera adds 10 pounds. And I know what you're thinking right now. How many cameras do they have on him? But see, there's no one here to even laugh at my jokes, really. So this is so confusing. Thank you. Um, One of my favorite TV shows is the TV show The Office. And one of my favorite episodes is an episode where this guy, Andy Bernard, is kind of new to The Office. And he's looking for a girlfriend, and he he wants to find someone he can flirt with. And he decides he's going to flirt with the receptionist, Pam. And so he goes to his friend, Jim, who everyone knows at the end of the series, ends up marrying Pam because they love each other. Jim's the one who knows her the best. And Andy says, you know, I want to flirt with her. What should I do? And Jim decides, well, this is a great time to play a joke on him and on Pam. So he gives Andy all the worst advice about how to flirt with Pam. He tells, her, tells him all the things she hates and tells him to go do those things. He tells him, talk a lot about Frisbee and talk a lot about Six Flags and use Pig Latin as much as you can. And then you get to watch Andy go and do all these things and Pam sit there just kind of shocked and amazed that like, what is going on? Why is he doing this? And then the, the, it all comes to a climax when uh, Jim tells Andy to get his um, banjo out And he tells them that Pam loves it when people play the banjo and sing in high falsetto voice. And so he goes up and he serenades her with the rainbow connection that Kermit the Frog made famous. And Pam is just shocked. And all she can say is, wow. But it doesn't work. She doesn't like him or go out with him. None of this moves her. And he thought that, you know, this was all the stuff he needed to do to get her to like him because he was blind to who she really was. He didn't know who she really was. And all that he did, even though he tried really, really hard, it was useless because he was blind to who she really was. And in fact, it it was worse than useless. It turned her off. The only thing that would have made it worse is if after finding out that she didn't like those things, if he kept doing it anyway, thinking that it would get her to like him. The problem is, that's what a lot of us do with God. A lot of us treat God as though he's as fictional as the TV character Pam Beasley. We decide we're going to love God and obey God according to the image we've made of him in our mind and what we've decided he would want and what would please him in our own heads without paying attention to who he really is and seeing him. And that would be fine if God were Santa Claus but he is the living, divine creator, God of all things, which means we need to relate to him according to who he is, not who we make him out to be. And it's kind of funny that we're worshiping in this unique way today, where we're not able to all be in church together, because what the question we want to wrestle with is, what makes worship real? What makes worship real? Is it beautiful buildings or exciting and engaging music, or long prayers, or liturgy, or sacraments, or any of those things? What makes worship real? And what we're going to see is what what makes worship real is that it's based on the truth of who God is. And if you're blind to who God is, you cannot worship him. And what we're going to see today is that it's very easy to go on worshiping God blindly, thinking that you're all right, when all along you're just spinning further and further away from God. For the last six weeks, we've been talking about this wheel behind me. It comes from the book of Judges in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And it's, it shows this vicious cycle that God's people were in, where they kept spinning round and round. And it wasn't just spinning round and round on a wheel like a hamster. It was actually spiraling downward, 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 further and further away from God. They'd start out by obeying God, and then they would disobey God, and then God would discipline, then they would cry out in distress, and then God would send a deliverer, and then it would all just happen over again, and over again, and over again. But in the story we're going to look at today, the wheel is, you know how when you roll a coin or spin a coin on a table, as it gets to the end, it starts to wobble slowly? Well, we're in the wobble part of the wheel. This one's different than all the other stories we've looked at these last six weeks. Because God's people have gone completely blind at this point to who God is. 
And so you can follow along on the app or you can turn in your Bible to Judges chapter 17 and follow the story with me. This is what it looks like to go blind to God. So Judges chapter 17. It starts with an old widow. And she has lost 1,100 silver coins. Well, she didn't lose the coins, actually. Someone stole them from her. And so she pronounces this curse. She calls on Yahweh, the Lord, to curse God, curse anyone or whoever it is that took this money from me. And her son, who's a grown man with his own kids and family, he hears this curse, and it really disturbs him, and it really makes him upset because he's the one who stole the money. And so he goes to his mom and he confesses. He says, Mom, you know, this, I, I'm the one who took the 1,100 silver coins. It was me. And she says, oh, the Lord bless you, my son. So now she wants to undo the curse. So she says, Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. But then that's not enough. So she wants to try and buy God out. And so what she does is she takes a bunch of that silver, those silver coins, and gives it to her son and has him make an image, an idol of yeah, of God, of Yahweh, to worship. And then her son goes, and he makes that idol, that image of Yahweh, the silver idol. And you might be thinking, well, that's, isn't that wrong? Aren't they not supposed to do that kind of thing? And you're right, it is one of the Ten Commandments not to do that exact thing. This is worse than giving your wife a Peloton for Christmas. This is an insult to God, smacking him in the face. So her son Micah, he takes the silver, and do you know, did I tell you what Micah means? I'll tell you in a couple minutes. He takes the silver, and he makes this idol of Yahweh, and he brings it into this house of gods that he has. Right? He's, yeah, he's, he's got a house of gods, of statues and idols, and some of them probably were representing family members he had and, and gods he worshiped from his ancestors who died. He brings this new idol of Yahweh in there and he makes a, a sacred vest called an ephod for it and puts it up and sets it up there with all the other gods that he's got. And that vest was supposed to be a way of you know, figuring out what God wanted you to do. And he just puts it alongside all the other house gods that he's got. Now here's, here's what Micah's name means. It means, who is like Yahweh? Or in other words, it means, there is no one like God. And yet... <laughs> The way he treats God is as though he's no different than any of the other gods in his life, any of the other idols. And you might think, that's crazy. And it is. That's crazy. And that's why the author, as he gets to this point in the story, he stops and he says, now, okay, you need to know something. This was a time when there was no king in Israel. In other words, there's no one to lead the people. There's no one to keep them straight. There's no one to keep them focused on God and make sure they were doing what God wanted them to do and give them an image of what God was like. There was no one, no king in Israel to help do that kind of thing. And so everyone was just doing what was right in their own eyes because he's embarrassed by this. So the story goes on. Some time goes by. Micah takes one of his sons and he makes him his priest and says, okay, you're going to now lead us in this new religion of our statue idol of Yahweh, and some time goes by, and, and one day a Levite shows up in their town at Micah's house, from, coming from Bethlehem, and I don't know if you remember who the Levites were. Do you remember the, this famous scene, um, hopefully from the Bible, but also from the movie, um, where Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, and he sees everyone's made this golden calf and they're worshiping it. And he's angry and God's angry. And he just says, who is on the Lord's side? Come stand with me. And when he does that, all the Levites, the whole tribe of Levi comes and stands with Moses. And he says to them, this day you have now consecrated yourselves. From now on, you will be the ones who lead the people in worship. The priests will be always Levites. And from now on, you're going to show people how to worship God truly and honestly. And you're going to stand for God. And so that's where this guy, he's from that tribe. And so they're supposed to always be working at the tabernacle, helping people worship God. But they didn't have their own land, and so they'd have to get people to help support them sometimes. And he's now traveling around looking for a place, and he shows up here at Micah's house, and Micah's like, well, this is great. I need a real priest. My son, you know, he's not that great at this. So he gets rid of his son as the priest, and he makes this new Levite, this young Levite, his, he said, you will be my priest and my father. 
And the Levite's like, all right, this is great. Because he gives them money, pays them, gives them food, gives them a place to live. And the Levite's like, this is great. My life is set. God is good. He's obviously taking care of me and watching out for me. And Mike is like, this is great. God is good. He's obviously pleased with what I'm doing. And he says to himself, you know, the Lord uh, is showing favor to me. He, he must be happy with me because, you know, now I've got this Levite as my priest to help serve here. Did I tell you who the priest was? I'll tell you that in another minute or two. So fast forward a little bit. Mike is there in his house. He's got his new statue god of Yahweh, and he's got his Levite priest there to help them worship this statue god of Yahweh, who, by the way, never actually tells him the way he's supposed to be worshiping God because the priest has forgotten himself, it seems. But act three of this whole story, the author starts by reminding us, remember now, there was no king in Israel. Everyone was just doing what was right in their own eyes. Everyone's just worshiping God however they see fit. So a group of guys come and show up one day from the tribe of Dan. Now, last week we talked about Samson and how he was from the tribe of Dan and he completely failed to do the one thing God wanted him to do, which was to drive out the Philistines so the tribe of Dan could take their piece of land. And so these guys from Dan are walking around, they're traveling around looking for a place for their tribe to go live now because they don't want to keep living near the Philistines. They're scared. And they're not going to take the place God called them to take. So they're, they're wandering around looking for a place to live. And they show up here at Micah's doorstep. And they meet this Levite. And they recognize by his accent that he's from Bethlehem. And like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I'm the priest here now. And they say, okay, great. Can you ask God if, if we're going to be successful when we go looking for a new place to live? And the Levite asks God and he comes back and tells them, yes, God says, okay, you're going to be successful. So they, they travel north. They go as, pretty much as far as they can go from the Philistines. And they find this place where these very peaceful people are living. They don't have an army. They don't have protections. They just got really good land and crops. And they're really friendly and nice, but easy to beat. Easy to beat up on. Easy to kick out because they have no defenses. And so they're like, oh, this must be God because the priest told us God was going to give us favor. They go back home. They get all of their rest of their whole tribe, and they start to travel north to this new place they're going to live and set up camp, forgetting what God called them to do. And so as they, get, as they travel through, they stop again at Micah's house, and they say to this priest, this Levite, hey, why don't you come with us? You can be our priest. Wouldn't it be better to be our priest, the priest for a whole tribe, than just for this guy's house? And the Levite's like, yeah, it would. So he leaves everything. He forgets Micah. But he takes this statue of Yahweh, this idol of Yahweh, and he, the ephod and all the other house gods that were in that little house that Micah had. And he takes off with the Danites. And they start to leave. And Micah comes running out after them. Saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And they turn around and say, what's your problem? Why are you yelling at us? Get out of here before we kill you. And listen to what Micah says to them, because it is probably the funniest thing I've ever heard. He says, you took the gods I made. What am I supposed to do now? I have nothing. And they turn around and tell him to shut up and go away. They're going to kill him and his whole family. So he shuts up and goes away. And they go up to that poor defenseless town that they'd found, and they attack them and beat them, and destroyed their town, and chased them out, and then rebuilt it there, rebuilt a new town there just for themselves, their tribe, and set up a place there for this statue of Yahweh, this idol of Yahweh, with that special sacred vest on them, so that they could now worship him there. And then the story ends by telling us who this Levite is, the name of this Levite. His name was Jonathan. He was the son of a guy named Gershom. Now, that probably doesn't ring any bells for you. But maybe you might know his great-grandfather, Moses. They went from Moses, who gave them God's law, who was one of the only people to ever see God, catch a glimpse of God, and who knew God intimately, to being completely blind to who God is within just a few generations because they kept spinning around on this wheel. And, and there's the tragedy. 
in this whole thing. One woman's silly idea about who God is takes wings when her son makes this idol of Yahweh and then becomes a whole new thing when he hires a priest to now mediate this new relationship with God through an idol, which then infects a whole tribe of Israel and then goes on to pretty much, as you read through the Old Testament, destroy the whole nation of Israel as they keep turning to idols and they completely forget who God is. And so they wander away from him. Blind worship is dangerously contagious and it spirals downward, dragging us further and further from God and further and further from life. Blind worship is foolish. It's stupid. I mean, that's the point of this story, isn't it? As you hear all of that, and some of you have read it, um, but as you hear it, it just sounds so stupid to think that you can use God to curse someone who stole from you. Anybody who knows God knows that's not true. To think that you can then undo God's judgment against someone by paying God off Anybody who knows God knows you can't do that. To think that you can make an idol of God, a statue that will represent him to worship him, everybody knows that's stupid. Let's worship God by doing the very thing he hates. Is that a good idea? Micah running out and telling him, you stole my God, now I've got nothing. You stole the God I made. It's like, well, just go make a new one for yourself. It's just stupid. The whole thing sounds so stupid. To think that God was, gonna, was blessing you as a tribe because you were in cowardice, running away from the thing God called you to do, and going and bullying another people out of their home. To think that, oh, this was God's blessing, it was complete lunacy. But it's what happens when we worship blindly. We forget completely who God is. It's foolish and it's stupid to think that we can make our own image of God and then worship that image. And that's obvious when you see it in a story like this, but it's not so obvious in our own lives because we don't have little houses of gods with statues of God around or Jesus around, do we? But here's what we might do. Here's where we might go wrong and worship blindly. We might make an image of God in our heads form an image of God in our minds that, that we came up with and then start treating that image we've made in our own mind as though that's who God is and what God's really like. We may not 3D print that image we've made up in our mind, but it becomes the thing that guides the way we worship and serve and relate to God. And before we know it, we're worshiping completely blindly because we are worshiping an image that we've made, even though we didn't actually make it out of silver. But it's still, we've made it in here. And that's the danger you and I need to watch out for. And I think we need to ask, how might we do that today? And I think a couple ways that you and I can stop and look at ourselves and say, I don't want to worship God blindly. I want to worship God in truth. So what are some ways that blind worship might happen in my life? One of them is something you could call sacramentalism, or when it's in its worst place, it would be superstition. And this is the idea that you put, um, you attribute power and influence to certain practices or actions or items as though they give you power to win God's favor. People treat communion this way, as though it doesn't matter what else I do in my life, as long as I receive communion, that means I'm okay with God. Well, no, that, now you've made that an idol. That's not true about God. That, that's blind worship. Some people treat that way, treat with um, the way they pray to the saints. As long as you know I pray to the saints, then I'm covered. Well, no, that's not true. That's not who God is. Read the Bible, discover who God is, and you'll know that that's not true. Others think that maybe more close to home for those of us who grew up in, in churches like ours that, oh, if I'm praying in tongues, that means I'm really close to God, I'm really spiritual, and that's a sign that, you know, I know if I'm doing that, I'm okay, and I'm really worshiping God. Well, again, read the Bible, and you'll know that that's not necessarily true. You can't take comfort in that as though that's the thing that's giving you a right relationship with God. Or maybe just some other way of experiencing God. Or maybe it's a cross you wear on your neck. Or a Bible you keep in your home, just all pristine and nice. There's things we keep around us sometimes, and we, we attribute to them value. And it's like, well, if I don't wear that cross, then I'm not safe with God. Or if I don't, you know, touch that Bible every morning, I'm not safe with God. Or if I don't pray before I eat, I'm probably going to choke to death on my food. We have all these things that we, we come up with in our heads, and they're not really who God is. 
but they shape us and they almost become like superstitions. But they're not flowing out of who God is. That's one way. I think maybe the bigger problem today is something I'd call subjectivism or individualism where we shape our worship around our preferences instead of God's character. We become the subject and the object of our worship. So, you know, I can only worship if it's this kind of music. You know, if you play me some country worship, I can't worship to that. You play me hymns, I don't even know what they're talking about. You play me the new contemporary stuff, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, if, if you ever say, I can't worship to that, but it's music that's actually written to glorify God, well, maybe you're shaping your worship around what you want instead of who God is. If you insist, well, I need to have liturgy, or I know I need to have free-form worship, right? Or if, you know, you're bouncing back and forth from place to place and church to church, or only in online churches because you just want to have an experience, those are all signs that you might be the object of your worship. You're just trying to do what fits you, not what fits God. You know, I need lights, I need the electric guitar, I need to be in the church to really worship. No, God is, wherever you sit down and begin to focus on him, you can begin to worship God. Jesus' greatest criticism was against people who thought, oh, we've worshiped God this way, we've tithed really well with all our stuff. And so they thought they'd obeyed these set rules that made it look like they were worshiping God. But Jesus says, yeah, you maybe have done that, and that's fine, but you've neglected mercy and justice. You're you're not being who God is. And God cares most of all about worship flowing out of who we are when we see him. That we don't worship blindly. We worship out of a response to seeing him. Because when we make ourselves and our preferences and our pleasure and our comfort level the object and destination of worship, We lose sight of God, and we're worshiping blindly. True worship is about God. It's expressed in ways that please God. Because true worship is a response to seeing God. If you don't see God, you cannot worship. And so what's the cure for this? What would help us really see God so we can worship? Well, remember what the narrator kept saying in the story? You know, remember... They didn't have a king at this time. They just needed a king. If they'd had a king, things would have been better. Without a king to represent God to the people, everyone just went wild and did whatever they wanted. They needed someone to rein in all their wrong ideas about God. And of course, those of you who've been doing the readings in our small groups, you know that what happens when you get to the kings is they don't really help at all. A few of them are good. Maybe a handful of them are good. But no human king is ever able to really help keep people in line, and really represent God. There's no human king that can actually do that. Because no human king can really give you a clear picture. Not clear enough of who God is and what God's like. No human king could give us a picture that could cure our blindness to God and help rescue us from blind worship. We needed a divine king. That's the cure for our blindness. And that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus entered this world. That's why he overcame sin. That's why he died and rose again and became king of kings. And all these stories and judges and in the entire Old Testament, they're all like a giant neon sign pointing to Jesus, saying Jesus is king. He's the one we need because now we can see God and we can really worship in truth. If we're going to truly worship God, we need a clear vision of God. How are we going to see God? unless he comes and lives among us. And that's what Jesus did. So you and I aren't left to make up our own images of God, make up our own ideas about God in our own heads, and then shape our worship and our experience of him around that. We can look at Jesus. We can look at Jesus and see what he said, look at what he's done, and when we do that, we see God. And then that transforms our worship. That makes our worship new and different. You and I don't have to figure it all out. We don't have to figure out life and we don't have to figure out what's right and wrong for ourselves. We're not left to just figure it out and do what's right in our own eyes. We only need to look at Jesus and we'll see God. And then we'll see clearly to know what life is, what it's about and what it's not about, what's important 
and what isn't important. And when we do that, we'll discover a whole new way of worshiping that is deeper, that is truer, that is freer, that is more alive than anything we've ever experienced before. When we can put aside the ideas of God we've just come up with in our head and be driven by seeing Jesus, that's when we'll begin to truly worship in a way that is powerful and transformational and will make us new. And it doesn't matter where you are for that to happen. You can be sitting in the church. You can be sitting in your house, sitting in your car, walking through a park. You can powerfully experience God when you put your eyes on him. And then your encounter with God will be soul deep. So this morning, I want to ask you to do two things. And worship team, come back and get ready. I want to ask you to do two things. One is I want you to think about and ask God to show you where your worship might be blind. Are there any places where your worship isn't clearly based on who God is? And maybe other things have crept in, other ideas have crept in, and you need to let go of those ideas. You need to put them aside and instead focus on Jesus. And then two, I want you to ask you to focus on Jesus this week. What could you do this week to help you focus more on Jesus? Well, it's reading the Gospels, reading what Jesus said, reading what Jesus did. Focus on Jesus and then worship God with your eyes wide open to who God is. So ask God, show me the places where I've got a distorted idea of who you are. And God, show me how to get my eyes on you because that's, I know that's when I can truly worship. I can put aside blind worship, Lord. I don't want to assume I'm fine with you. I want to be fine with you because I see you. And take a moment right now. Think about that. And take a moment too. As we come to this moment, what we normally do in our service is we take some time to respond by singing and by giving. So you could do that right now too. You could use the app and you could give your offering right now. Remember, it's an act of worship. You're not giving because of a service. You're worshiping God by giving. And it's crucial and vitally important that we keep doing that now, especially when we can't gather together. So take a moment now. Open that up or go up on the top of this webpage and hit that give button and give as an act of worship to God. And then our team's gonna lead us in worship. And I think what Jesus wants you to do right now is press in to him and see him. He wants you to worship out of the depth of your soul. He doesn't care about the outside stuff. God is looking for worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter where you do that. It doesn't matter what that looks like, right? It only matters that you worship him out of the depth of your heart, out of a vision of who he is that's true and real. So let's take some time.